Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Carmen Dolea. I am the um, 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 head of unit of the International Health Regulation Secretariat uh, in the Division of um, uh, Health Emergency Preparedness in the Emergencies Program at WHO. Um, I have uh, about 18 slides that I want to walk you through. Uh, it's a completely different format than what you have heard before. Uh, it's not very immediately relevant to the infodemics, but it gives you an overview of what IHR is. Um, and a little bit at the end, as, uh, as Tina mentioned, um, um, about um, where infodemics fit in the, in the emergency response of WHO um, and uh, how is this linked with the IHR. So the, my talk of today will uh, touch uh, a little bit about an introduction about international health regulations, um, emergency committee and public health emergency of international concern on the idea that oftentimes these things are misunderstood and, and that misunderstanding may lead to some kind of infodemics. Um, a little bit about obligations and provisions uh, in the IHR in relation to international traffic, which is uh, a hot topic of the day. And then, uh, as I mentioned, the infodemics um, and the emergency response. Um, so briefly, you know that the IHR um, is a legally binding agreement uh, among uh, 196 uh, state parties, all of the WHO member states plus two non-member states, Holy See and Liechtenstein, to work together basically for global health security. It follows a long list of international regulations from even before 1969, um, meant to um, provide uh, commonly agreed ways of working among member states to prevent international spread of diseases. WHO is, coordination, uh, is coordinating and facilitating the implementation of the regulations. Um, and um, uh, you will see basically the purpose and the scope of, the, of these revised international health regulations, which were revised after the SARS um, outbreak in 2003. The revision process took more than five years. But the main purpose uh, of the, these binding regulations are to prevent, protect against, control, and provide a public health response to the international spread of diseases, but in ways that are commensurate with and restricted to the public health risks and avoid unnecessary interference with international traffic. So um, the new thing brought by the agreements uh, of the revised IHR is this balance of uh, ensuring that whatever response is given to, to public health risks with, with uh, risk of international spread, uh, these measures do not interfere um, unnecessarily with the international traffic. So how does it work? <clears throat> so there are obligations under the regulations, as you know, for state parties to um, manage an event that may pose international risk of uh, risk of international spread, which means obligation to notify um, an event, verify the information, uh, provide information to WHO, and institute some measures for the rapid response. They're also mandated by the regulations to have in place capacities for detection, prevention, and response of such events, um, and uh, also to they have obligations to manage the risk of international spread without interference with international traffic. What does WHO do for that? WHO also has obligations um, to communicate with the national IHR focal points, uh, which are, again, an obligation of state parties to establish a center, which has to be in, in uh, constant communication with WHO with regards to events that may pose a risk of international spread. WHO also conduct uh, risk assessments uh, of the events and um, implements uh, operations for responding uh, of such events. Uh, also supports countries to um, assess, monitor, and report on their uh, core capacities and manage the risk of international spread through the emergency committees and through monitoring travel and trade restrictions. When it comes to the, uh, what events should be notified to WHO, um, the regulations contains an annex that provides a bit of an algorithm of how countries should uh, examine events that may pose a risk um, and then uh, report these to the, notify these to WHO. But there are four diseases that require immediate notification. So when cases of uh, 
smallpox now is eradicated, but if they appear or polio due to the Y type or a human influenza virus due to a new subtype or a SARS um, uh, disease, the case, these should be immediately notifiable to WHO. For any other diseases, there will be uh, an assessment and an analysis of the potential impact to public health, whether the event is unexpected, whether it poses a significant risk of international spread or whether there are significant risk of restrictions of international travel. If these, event, if these questions are answered yes, then the event is then notified to WHO. Uh, what follows is that a risk assessment uh, uh, conducted by WHO through an agreed um, template and, and processes and procedures uh, in collaboration with the countries and with the regional offices um, and this risk assessment will then guide the, the um, um, decisions uh, of WHO to either possibly convene an emergency committee to assess if the event is constitutes a public health emergency of international concern or uh, implement other um, operations as required by the uh, severity and the risk posed by the event. Um, excuse me. Um, so that is the way that, uh, again, um, uh, WHO uh, refers an event for considerations uh, to the emergency committee. Um, this is where um, the um, rapid risk assessment and the emergency response framework are coming together to understand uh, the uh, requirements for information sharing and communication. So after an event is being detected and, and verified and the risk assessment is conducted, WHO shares the information with other state parties through the event information sign or publishes uh, uh, or and or publishes it through the disease outbreak news or other, in other situation reports. And the grading, uh, the type of uh, uh, risk posed by the event, uh, the grading would be called, then informs the decisions that are needed for the um, operations uh, response. Um, now a bit of a clarification about this emergency committee. Uh, you probably heard uh, a lot about uh, its role and uh, and positions in the in the declaration of an emergency of a public health emergency of international concern. So let me just be very clear on what is the position of this emergency committee. So um, the director general is required by the new regulations to uh, seek advice from an emergency committee under the regulation uh, on whether the event constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. After all of these uh, risks analysis and assessments have been done, then a group of experts identified uh, from a roster of experts established also under the regulation is constituted by the director general um, in, um, in respect of uh, geographical uh, um, uh, gender um, uh, representation, equitable representation, and uh, of course with the expertise required by the event uh, in question. And the, uh, this committee will examine uh, information provided by the affected countries and the uh, information provided by WHO and will provide advice to the Director General on three elements that describe what a uh, public health emergency of international concern is uh, understood under the regulation. And these elements are whether the event is extraordinary, whether it constitutes a risk to other states through the international spread, or and, excuse me, if the event requires international coordination, um, um, coordination of the international response. The, um, the consequences of uh, a determination of a public health emergency of international concern are the issuance of temporary recommendations. So how, how does it follow then from the meeting of the emergency committee and the actual determination of this PHEIC? Uh, the uh, obligation rests with the director general to make this determination under the regulations taking into account the advice that he received from the emergency committee, but also other elements um, that, uh, that uh, should inform him. Um, this includes uh, in information collected from the state parties, um, um, 
um, and other other considerations related to the to the risk posed by the event. So what happened after the determination is that the Director General issues temporary recommendations, which are non-binding uh, advice from WHO to help countries uh, reduce the risk of international spread. Um, that may include also um, transparency in sharing information, collaboration and support among countries, uh, strengthening research for uh, vaccine therapeutics and diagnostics development. Um, other things that the uh, issuance of uh, temp recommendation and the declaration uh, triggers from state parties is some additional obligations for them to report to WHO on measures that significantly interfere with international traffic, uh, which we'll discuss later in the slides. What happened, and this may be one link with the infodemics, or if you want, the misunderstandings uh, of, of uh, what the reality or, or what the obligations are, is that in some countries, uh, the declaration of a public health emergency of international concern is followed by certain protocols uh, or procedures uh, to be implemented, or even in some agencies, they use the determination of the fake to trigger the release of funding for the response which is not what the uh, IHR uh, foresaw or, or what the uh, negotiator of the agreement have had in mind. But this is one of the issues that is quite, uh, uh, quite uh, controversial and, and uh, being currently discussed uh, uh, by, the, by the review committee. Um, I think we've covered these elements of what enters into a determination of a public health emergency of international concern, so I won't dwell on this slide uh, anymore. Just as a reminder of the events which actually were considered by a, a specific emergency committee, so each of these events had had a uh, different composition of their members. It's not an emergency committee that is uh, constituted all along. It's separate groups of people, experts, um, that are pre-selected in this roster of experts and that are convened for the specific event. Um, so you see that the uh, committee was, the, an emergency committee was convened by the director general for nine events since the enter into force of the new revised regulations. And for six of these events, uh, the determination were that they constituted a public health emergency of international concern. Um, I'll move now uh, quickly to the other aspect of the um, uh, obligations for international traffic, um, because um, um, this is one of the issues that also created the controversy in understanding, or at least uh, uh, lack of uh, lack of um, uh, understanding of uh, of this situation. So the regulation provides a number of measures that countries can put in place to prevent the importation of cases or the spread uh, international spread of diseases. That uh, that could be advisory um, aspects, uh, vaccination recommendation, protective measures, and so on. Then there's more uh, detailed and specific uh, uh, health measures such as entry screening, exit screening, um, um, or uh, uh, invasive and non-invasive medical examination that are allowed for countries to implement based on the risk assessment that they conducted and the risk that they perceive as being um, incurred to their population. The top of this triangle, though, it concerns a set of measures that are more controversial and, and uh, for which there has been a lot of discussion among, uh, among state parties on how to regulate these measures. These are measures that actually um, stop the movement of people across borders. Uh, they are defined in the regulation as, as measures that significantly interfere with international traffic for more than 24 hours, which means uh, refusal of entry or exit, um, and, and so on. So these include uh, the dispose for population and for goods uh, um, as well. So these include closing of borders, travel bans, trade bans, and so on and so forth. These are governed by what is known as the Article 43, which provides a set of obligations for state parties to um, inform WHO when they put in place uh, such measures uh, and to provide the public health rationale, the justification uh, on, what, on, on what basis, scientific basis, have these measures been imposed. The only obligation then uh, that WHO has under this article 
is to share information about these measures with other state parties. There is no obligation in the IHR for WHO either to contest the measures that were put in place by countries or to hold countries to account for the measures that they implemented if they go beyond what has been recommended by WHO or by the temp recommendation if the event was considered a public health emergency of international concern. The next slides provide you in a bit, of, in a bit more detail the algorithm that is currently used uh, by WHO to, uh, to monitor uh, these, uh, these, uh, these measures. Um, again, I will not dwell on it uh, because of time, but just to say uh, uh, the problems that, they, that are known with regards to this uh, compliance with reporting uh, uh, such measures not even the measures, but also the outbreaks that, that countries are required to report to WHO. There is, of course, always reluctance uh, in, in uh, informing uh, WHO of events that are happening on, on the country's territory. Um, although the understanding and the agreement when the regulations were reviewed that early, was that early reporting would help everybody to put in place uh, uh, effective response measures. But this reluctance in reporting may stem from a possibly two, uh, two reasons. One is possibly this, the lack of capacity. Uh, countries don't have the resources to notify quickly enough or to make an assessment quickly enough. Um, uh, so one, one approach to, to go about it would be, for example, to provide additional resources or uh, even in the, in the format of international observers to those states to help them uh, do uh, early analysis, or there's simply a lack of will because of the perceived, uh, um, uh, the real or perceived consequences that such a declaration might, might have for the economies of countries. So basically countries feel threatened that if they report an outbreak, there will be restrictions imposed by other countries against them. And that's uh, the reluctance for, for reporting. So there may be two options to that, either to increase the cost of non-reporting um, by, for example, uh, uh, providing legal protection for, um, for non-state actors that come forward with reporting or uh, encourage uh, more accountability, um, uh, stronger accountability mechanisms uh, um, like name on shame, for example or increase the benefit of reporting. So provide some, some incentives and reassurance for countries um, uh, in case of potential um, uh, restrictions that may be uh, incurred uh, due to early reporting. Um, I'll go now quickly through the principle of uh, emergency preparedness and response, which you probably know that are enshrined in the um, enshrined that are included and described in detail in the emergency response framework, which is a framework of WHO uh, operations uh, established or and, and being implemented after the establishment of the emergency response, uh, uh, the health emergency program, excuse me. So, um, uh, so this program uh, uh, has the following functions, as you see there. Uh, first, to ensure emergency country emergency preparedness, uh, capacity building, and, and uh, compliance uh, with the IHR regulations uh, requirements for core capacities. Um, a function on infection hazards management, uh, health emergency information and risk assessment, emergency operations, um, and management administration and external relations. Um, WHO uh, critical functions uh, for emergency response are then constituted into what is called in the ERF book, an incident management system. And this system has uh, similar, uh, more or less similar functions, which consist of leadership, uh, partner coordination, information and planning, health operations and technical expertise, operational support and logistics, and finance and administration. So since the establishment of the infodemics, then uh, uh, they uh, represented an, an integral part of the incident management structure and the emergency response framework. And I provided uh, as, a, as an example here, um, a structure for the current uh, COVID-19 uh, program, just illustrative without the, the, the actual names, but just to tell you how complex uh, a, um, an emergency response uh, 
um, architecture within, and that's only within WHO uh, headquarters, and where the infodemics actually fit uh, within the overall uh, uh, pillars of response. Um, they they have uh, their own uh, their own pillar, if you want. Uh, along with uh, partner coordination, health information sharing, uh, health operations, and so on. And there's a whole lot of other aspects uh, uh, not directly related to the operation, but which needs, needs to uh, inform and regularly be in contact and interaction with the incident management uh, for a specific event. I will just stop here in case there are uh, any questions. Um, and I, I thank you for again for the opportunity uh, and happy to provide even more details um, um, as necessary. Over to you, Tina.